Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to our midweek study. Uh, we've been engaged for a few months now in the study of the cloud of witnesses, a phrase that appears in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, after the, the writer of Hebrews has enumerated in Hebrews chapter 11, this great list of faithful men and women from ages past. Uh, he begins in Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11 by talking about Abel and then Enoch and Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob. And then there's mention of Jacob's son, Joseph, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. That's the summary that we get of Joseph. That's the reference to his faith that we find in Hebrews chapter 11. But there is so much contained about him in the book of Genesis. As we noticed last week, uh, a full quarter of the book of Genesis, just over 25% of Genesis, is related directly to Joseph's life. A full half of Genesis is related to the generation of Jacob and the, the generation of his sons. And so there was just no way that we could do justice uh, to Joseph's life and his exhibition of, of faithfulness to God throughout his life in the course of one lesson. In fact, it may take us three, may take us even four to do that. So we started last week with looking at what we find in Genesis chapters 37 and 39. We'll continue in chapter 39 tonight. And uh, chapter 38 is that sidetrack, that detour, that aside that discusses Judah and Tamar. But what we saw in last week's discussion was that Joseph is the favored son of his father. He is the firstborn son of Jacob's favored wife, Rachel. And she ultimately gives birth to a second son, Benjamin. She dies in childbirth, and Jacob loses his beloved Rachel. But Joseph continues to grow and develop as Jacob's favored son. He's given this richly ornamented robe, this beautiful robe that distinguishes him from his brothers. And then in chapter 37 of Genesis, we begin to read about events that transpire when Joseph is 17 years old. And we see him go from favored son to foreign slave. His brothers hated him. They couldn't speak a kind word to him. When he related his dreams to them, they hated him even more. And when he was sent by his father to check on his brothers, uh, initially 45 miles away and ultimately 60 miles away, a long, dangerous journey for Joseph, rather than being welcomed and received and uh, provided for by his brothers, they are talked out of their initial plan to kill him and settle instead for selling their own flesh and blood for 20, 20 shekels of silver. What we'll find later in the Law of Moses is the redemption price of a young male slave. And so he is sold to these near relatives, these Midianites, these Ishmaelites, as they are variously called. And ultimately, they take him down in this caravan to Egypt, sell him into the household of a man named Potiphar, who was the captain of Pharaoh's guard, uh, the head of the secret service. And even there, we ended last week by noticing that Joseph maintains his faith in God. And we're told in Genesis chapter 39, verse 2, that the Lord was with Joseph. Um, and though things have gone so badly for Joseph, um, he doesn't lose that underlying faith in God. And because of that, God continues to bless him. And I talked about at the end of last week's class, his work ethic, the kind of work ethic that we find described in the New Testament uh, in places like Ephesians chapter 6 and Colossians chapter 3, this idea for, for those who find themselves in servitude, who find themselves in a circumstance of slavery, to work as though they served their ultimate master, as though they were working for God, and not just trying to please an earthly master, and not just working hard when someone was watching, uh, but to do their very best 
regardless of who was there or who wasn't there, knowing that both they and their master have an ultimate master in heaven. And apparently this is how Joseph goes about his work. He's been taken away from his father's household, uh, thought he might die when he was in that dry cistern, was shackled and chained. In fact, in, in Psalm 105, you, you read about the, the shackles that were put on Joseph, not something that the text in Genesis tells us, but that's poetically described in uh, Psalm 105. And yet uh, he works in such a way that gains both God's favor and his master's favor. And this is described in such great detail that I just wanted to read it with you, beginning in verse, thir uh, verse 3 of Genesis 39. When his master saw that Yahweh was with him, the Lord was with him, and that Yahweh gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his master's eyes, in Potiphar's eyes, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household. He entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he was put in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Uh, we'll find in the book of Jeremiah that God's counsel through Jeremiah to his people in exile in Babylon was, seek the welfare of the city, seek the welfare of the land where you are, because in its welfare, you will have welfare. Um, and you will have benefit and blessing. Joseph, centuries earlier, seems to have that attitude. He knows that as Potiphar's house prospers, he will prosper. And so he does everything within his power to make that happen. And God blesses Joseph. God blesses Potiphar's household. And he doesn't have to concern himself with anything except the, the food that he ate. Some have suggested that it was Egyptian custom that they could not eat food prepared by a foreigner. So the only thing that was outside of Joseph's supervision was the preparation of Potiphar's food. Or it may just be saying that Joseph took care of so much that all Potiphar had to worry about was, you know, using his, his arm and his elbow and his hand to get food into his own mouth. Regardless, uh, Joseph rises from this lowly foreign slave to being in charge of this high official's entire household. As Joseph himself will say in a few verse late, verses later, the only thing that was withheld from him was what should have been withheld from him, and that was Potiphar's wife. And this is where the story takes a twist and where we pick up our study tonight. Uh, we're told that Joseph was handsome, uh, this is verse, the end of verse 6. Joseph was well-built and handsome. Uh, another translation says that, that he was handsome in form and appearance, pretty much the exact language that was used to describe his mother in Genesis chapter 29, verse 17, uh, that Rachel was beautiful in face and form. And he must have taken after his mother very much like that. And that gets the attention of Potiphar's wife. And she begins to look upon Joseph with sexual desire. And she sought to seduce him with her words, not just once, but multiple times. Um, in verse 7, while uh, his master, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But verse 8 says, he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Um, Many male servants would have been flattered uh, and blown away by this seduction attempt by their, their master's wife. You think about what has been included already in the book of, of Genesis 
in regard to sexual sin and uh, sexual crime. And Joseph would have been following a pattern that's been well established in the book of Gen in the book of Genesis if he had yielded to that temptation, if he had been drawn in by Potiphar's wife's seductive words. Uh, we remember the sin of Lot with his two daughters uh, when he was in a drunken state and how he fathered two sons uh, by his daughters. We, we think of uh, Reuben's sexual relationship with his father's concubine, with Bilhah, who was uh, the handmaid of, of Rachel, Judah's sexual sin with his daughter-in-law, Tamar, uh, but only because he, he thought she was a prostitute, which just adds an, entire, uh, a, an entirely different uh, and even more disturbing element to that story. Sadly, we read about the rape, uh, the sexual assault of Dinah, who was Joseph's sister. And so we, we had this sad pattern already in the book of of Genesis. And if another of Jacob's sons had been approached in such a way by Potiphar's wife as being a servant in that household, though there's little doubt about how they would have responded, but not Joseph, uh, not with his sense of morals, his sense of integrity, his sense of values. And so he refuses her advances and her seductive words. And he, and he just doesn't think that he can sin against his master, against his master's wife in this way. But ultimately, he says, I can't sin against God this way. And ultimately, this is a reminder uh, of the one against whom all sin is an offense, even though others are, are harmed by that as well. It reminds me of what David writes in Psalm 51 about his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, he had sinned against Bathsheba, he had sinned against Uriah. He had sinned against his own body. And yet he will express in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Ultimately, as, much, uh, as many offenses as were involved in, in that taking of Uriah's wife, ultimately that great sin was against God. We're told that her advances were persistent. They were day after day. And Joseph was persistent in his refusals as well, until one day when no one else was, was in the house. Verse 12 says that she caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me, but he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Verse 13, when she saw that she had, he had left uh, his cloak, sorry, I lost my place there, had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to, to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Verse 16, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Uh, Joseph did the only thing that, that he felt he could do at that point, which was uh, to, to leave, to get himself out of the situation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us that God won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear, but with the temptation, we'll always provide a way of escape. And sometimes that's a, a literal physical way of escape. Sometimes it's, it's the door in, in the structure that is there, and that's, that's what uh, Joseph does. 2 Timothy 2.22 says to, to flee youthful lusts, to run away from them, and I know that's speaking metaphorically there, but sometimes that has to be the case physically. You have to get yourself out, physically get yourself out of that situation and that, that circumstance. And the result of that is that Potiphar's wife feels so insulted and humiliated by Joseph's refusal that she has to lash out at him with false ac accusations, not light false accusations, but extremely heavy and serious ones. This is just another uh, demonstration of the principle that darkness hates 
the light. Uh, Joseph's integrity and morality exposed her wickedness. And though the text specifically mentions that Potiphar was enraged about Joseph's alleged advances toward his wife, I, I think he likely shows great restraint toward uh, Joseph in not having him put to death. Um, verse 19, when his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Uh, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But as angry as it says he was, I think it is a demonstration of his deep respect and admiration for Joseph. And maybe uh, the, the part of him that just couldn't believe that Joseph would have done this. He could have easily had Joseph put to death. He's a, he's a foreign slave. He has no rights. He has no claim to any justice system uh, in Egypt. Uh, but his, uh, his, his master puts him in a prison that he himself seems to be in charge of. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. So Joseph is placed uh, in the equivalent of a federal penitentiary where the king's prisoners were held probably better conditions than you would find in, in just a, a typical jail in Egypt. But once again, despite these reversals, despite the, the false accusations that, that have come and the, the entire injustice of the situation, Joseph sets about doing things the way he knows God wants them to be done. Uh, he lives by high character, by integrity, by this incredible uh, work ethic and the way he meets the responsibilities that, that are given him. And so in the closing verses of, of chapter 39, we read really a summary of what we read about what took place in Potiphar's household. The circumstances are just different. So the end of verse 20 uh, while Joseph was still there in prison, the Lord was with him. Doesn't matter if he's in a dry cistern, if he's in Potiphar's house, if he's in prison, he can't be where Yahweh isn't. And so God is with him. Uh, God showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who were in the prison. He's not even an Egyptian. He's this... Uh, former Hebrew slave who, who has been falsely accused and he's in jail. He's now in charge of everyone else in the prison, was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in all that he did. Uh, same story, different chapter. And yet Joseph languishes here for quite a while. Um, we're told in... Uh, verse 1 of chapter 40, some time later, the cupbearer and the baker, these, these officials of Pharaoh are put in the same prison. Some time later, we don't know how much later, but we do know that about 13 years pass from the time Joseph was sold as a slave to the time that he rises to being second in command in Egypt. He's 17 years old at that point, when he rises to, to prominence in Egypt, he is 30. So we've got to, you know, we, we've got 13 years to play with here. So some time likely means months, even a few years. Some time later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt defended their master. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, was angry with his two officials, and that could have been for something extremely trivial. The king doesn't have to have much uh, rationale or reason to, to throw officials into prison. Um, he put them in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard, the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. It keeps making reference to the captain of the guard. We were told earlier that Potiphar was the captain of the guard. So there, there is still a, a high possibility if not likelihood that Potiphar is still looking out for the welfare of Joseph. And then at the end of verse four, and after they had been in custody for some time. So Joseph has already been in prison for a while when the, the cupbearer and the baker are put into prison as, as well. And then some time passes after that before both of those men have a dream 
on the on the same night and um yet god continues to bless joseph in in this circumstance one of the beatitudes the last beatitude that jesus shares at the beginning of matthew chapter 5 uh blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In the same way they persecuted the patriarchs who were before you. Uh, patriarchs like Joseph. And um, the, these two uh, officials don't know how long they had been in the service of, of Pharaoh, the cupbearer, was the one that would take the king would would pour wine into the king's uh, goblet or cup. He would pour some of that wine into his own hand. He would taste it to make sure that it was free from poisons or contamination before the cup was given to the king. He was probably also in in charge of the supply of wine and the quality of wine that was available for the king and all of his officials. This is the same. Uh, office that would be held by Nehemiah 1400 years later. Uh, he was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes of Persia. Uh, the baker would have been in charge of all the preparation of breads, pastries, other foods for daily consumption, and large banquets in the royal court. Um, whatever they had done to displease uh, Pharaoh uh, his, his anger led them to be imprisoned. And on the same night, both of these men have, have dreams. And they weren't just the run-of-the-mill kind of dreams that, that you have. Um, they're disturbing dreams. And obviously, they've shared their dreams with one another the next morning. And they're even more despondent because they believe that these dreams mean something. But they have no idea what they might mean. Uh, so verse 6, when Joseph came to them the next morning, this is verse 6 of Genesis 30, when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? And the thing that impresses me here is that um, Joseph even cares why they look sad. I mean, Joseph's got reason to be sad. This is probably a few years down the line here, uh, and he's still in prison. Not justly, but unjustly. He's there because of false accusations. He's never had an opportunity to try to set the record straight on what actually happened. And rather than continuing to feel sorry for himself, he's demonstrating again a spirit that we find described uh, in, in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, that we're to do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, we are to regard one another as being more important than ourselves, not to look out only for our own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Uh, and that's what Joseph is doing. And he says, you know, why are you guys so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered. There's no one to interpret them. So that, uh, and then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? This is the same type statement that Daniel will make centuries later before Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar asked, you know, Daniel, can you interpret th th this dream? Daniel says, no, I can't, but there's a God who reveals mysteries and he will explain this dream to you. Joseph's uh, mindset is the same. He doesn't claim any special insider knowledge himself. He just says, interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. And the cupbearer tells him this dream that he had, vivid dream that, that he just can't get out of his head, of seeing this grapevine that had three branches. And in sort of time-lapse fashion, uh, dream-lapse fashion, uh, the, those three branches of, of the grapevine budded and blossomed and put on grapes, and those grapes ripened. I mean, just like you would see a, a time lapse of a, of a plant growing from a seedling to, to maturity or um, 
some other thing that you might watch on on uh, Animal Planet or on um, I, I went blank on on the network. Uh, anyway, I'm going to drive myself crazy trying to think it over here. But you know what I'm talking about. You you see something that happens in real time over a long uh, time frame, and it's just condensed. That's what the cupbearer sees in this dream. And he reaches out with his hand and he takes those uh, ripe grapes and animal planet. That's what I was trying to think of. And he squeezes those ripe grapes into Pharaoh's cup and he hands the cup to Pharaoh. And Joseph says, oh, that dream means something. What it means is th something significant is going to happen in three days. The three branches represent three days. And what it means is in three days, Pharaoh is going to uh, lift up your head. He's going to restore you to your position. You're going to cup, put Pharaoh's cup back in his hand. You're going to pick up your responsibilities just like you used to do. And Joseph is so confident that this is going to happen that he says in verse 14, when this goes well with you, um, this can't not happen. God has said it's going to happen. And he's revealed this to you through this dream. So when this comes to pass, three days from now, I want you to remember me. And I want you to show me kindness. I want you to mention me to Pharaoh. And I want you to get me out of this prison because I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And I've done nothing that deserves being put here in this dungeon. Um, he doesn't throw Potiphar's wife under the bus. He doesn't get into that. He just says, I'm here unjustly. And when you are restored to your position, make it known. Well, this encourages the baker. He sees how the, the cupbearer's dream was interpreted very favorably. So he says, okay, my dream had three in it as well. Uh, but in my dream, there were three baskets of bread on my head. And in the top basket were all these uh, various kinds of baked goods that had been prepared for Pharaoh, but the birds of the air were eating them out of the, the top basket on my head. And Joseph says, well, this is what it means. The three baskets are three days, just like the three branches of the grapevine were, were three days. And in three days, your head's going to be lifted up and your head's going to be lifted off. And you'll be impaled on a pole, your body will, other translations, uh, you will be hanged, and the birds of the air will eat away your flesh. Um, as joyful as the cupbearer must have been with the interpretation of his dream, the baker must have been despondent. The cupbearer was thinking, man, this guy is great. He knows what he's talking about. If I were the baker, I would start rationalizing and, and, and thinking, you know, well, who is this guy anyway? Who does he think he is? Uh, just because he says this is going to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. But that's exactly what happens. Three days later was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the baker in the presence of his officials. The cupbearer is restored to his position. Uh, the baker is either hanged or uh, has, has his head cut off and his body impaled on a pole. And it was just as Joseph had told them in his interpretation of their dreams. And then Joseph just can't catch a break. The last verse of chapter 40, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. How could you forget? I mean, when you're languishing in that dungeon, in that jail, you don't know if you're going to live or die. And, and this, this foreigner uh, who, who's in jail with you, who's in charge of all the prisoners, he tells you what's going to happen, and it happens, and only three days have passed, and somehow he just forgets him, and two full years transpire. Again, we've noticed a lot of time has already transpired, and yet two more years are added on to that, and yet knowing Joseph like I think we know him, he doesn't stop doing things the way he's always done them. You know, he, he knows three days later that the cupbearer um, is restored to his position. God said it was going to happen. And nobody comes the next day to release him or the next day or the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year. Two years go by. 
And as far as I can tell from the text, Joseph is still doing what he had been doing. He's still in charge of all the prisoners. He doesn't back out on his faith in God just because things don't go favorably because of the failings of man. God hasn't failed him here. The cupbearer failed him. And what happens two years later is that Pharaoh has a couple of dreams one night uh, that, that haunt him, and he can't get those dreams out of his mind. The first dream that he has, he sees uh, these seven cows coming up out of the Nile River. They're beautiful cows. Uh, I don't know if cows are beautiful to you, but if, if you grew up on a farm, if you've raised cattle, cattle are a beautiful thing. And he sees these fat cattle, these sleek cattle, shiny cattle coming up out of the Jordan River. And after them, seven other cows that he'll, as Pharaoh describes it to um, Joseph later, the ugliest cows he had ever seen, ugliest cows in Egypt. Seven of them, they're ugly, they're skinny, they're, they're gaunt. They come up and stand beside the fat, fat, sleek cows, and they consume them. What he'll share in his retelling of the dream to Joseph later is that these ugly, gaunt cows don't get any bigger. They're as ugly as they were to start with, and he wakes up. And he's trying to figure out what the dream means. He goes back to sleep. And he has another dream about seven heads of grain that were on a single stalk. And they, they were full, they were healthy, they were good. They, they were abundant heads of grain. And on the same stalk come up these seven other heads of grain that are thin, they're scorched by the east wind, looks like no nutritional value, couldn't make anything out of them. And these scrawny heads of grain consume the seven healthy full heads of grain. And his mind was so troubled by these dreams. Again, you know, I think God, like he did with the cupbearer uh, cup and the baker, he's letting them know th these aren't run-of-the-mill dreams. I think Pharaoh intuitively knows from the Lord who sent these dreams, this is significant. This is meaningful. You need to be troubled by this. So he calls together his, his magicians and his wise men, Unlike Nebuchadnezzar centuries later, who says, tell me my dream and what it means, he freely tells the wise men and the magicians what he dreamed. Uh, he says, I'm dying to know what they mean. And amazingly, they don't even make anything up. Uh, there, there's something about these dreams that prevent them from just shooting from the hip and flying by the seat of their pants and just making something up. Uh, something that they think would, would please Pharaoh, uh, they don't even do that. And that's when the, the penny drops. The, the, the cupbearer has been witnessing all of this. He, he's heard the telling of Pharaoh's dreams to his wise men and his magicians, and he goes, oh no, I just remembered something that I should have remembered two years ago. Verse nine, the cupbearer said to Pharaoh today, I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Uh, Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, um, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving uh, each man the interpretation of his dream, and things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. Uh, not wanting to, to blame you for that, Pharaoh, but that's what happened. And Pharaoh immediately seizes upon that. He sends for Joseph, has him brought from the, uh, the dungeon. Joseph is shaved, his, his clothes are changed. And uh, he says to Joseph in verse 15, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that you can hear a dream and you can interpret it. And Joseph once again defers to the greatness and the goodness and the wisdom and the revelatory nature of God. Uh, he says, I can't do it, verse 16, but God will give Pharaoh the answer, his desi the answer he desires. So Pharaoh now relates the dreams to, to Joseph. And um, Joseph says, you know, when he, when he hears 
the dreams, he immediately says to him, uh, verse 25, Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. Seven ugly cows, seven years. Seven full heads of grain, seven years. Seven uh, thin, wind-scorched uh, heads of grain, seven years. And God's given you you know, the, the same dream in two different forms to let you know, number one, that this is definitely going to happen. You had the two dreams to, to reinforce the surety of it and to let you know that this is coming soon. Verse 28, it is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. Uh, booming economy, bumper crops, we're going to have seven years like we've never had before. But what happens in the next seven years is going to make us forget all about that. But seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten. The famine and famine uh, will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the, the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God. This can't not happen. The next 14 years are set, and God will do it soon. And then Joseph basically writes his job description. He says, you know, Pharaoh looks, need, needs to look for a wise and discerning man to oversee the, the project of, of what needs to be done with these commissioners who need to go out through the land of Egypt through the next seven years, and 20% of the crop in each of those seven years needs to be put away in, in storehouses so that when the famine comes, there will be food for Egypt. Uh, turns out there'll be food for people from other lands as well. Uh, the plan seems good. Verse 37, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. And he asked, who, who can we find that could do this? A man in whom is the spirit of God. Then Pharaoh says to, to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there's no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace. All my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. He puts him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. He gives him his signet ring uh, and puts it on his finger. He dresses him in fine robes of linen, puts a gold chain around his neck, makes him uh, ride in a chariot as his second in, in command. People are to, to shout, make way or bow down as he passes that way. Uh, it reminds us of the way, again, centuries later, Daniel is going to be elevated in Babylon uh, and how Mordecai is going to be honored in Persia after that. Uh, he is given an Egyptian wife. He's given as his wife, uh, Asenath, who was the daughter of Potiphera, who was the priest of An. Uh, An was the Egyptian name of, of the city. This is where Ra, the sun god, was worshipped. The Greek name uh, for that city is going to be Heliopolis, the city of the sun. Uh, this was an, an extremely, the, the sun god was the greatest god in Egypt. This is the priest of the sun god Ra. This is the, the priest's daughter, Asenath, and she is given to uh, Joseph as a wife. Uh, this probably adds legitimacy to him, uh, being a foreigner as, as he was, uh, probably also to add legitimacy. He is given this Egyptian name, Zaphonath Penea. And so he goes through the, the entire land of Egypt, Let's see, before I move on, verse 46, that's where we learn that he's now 30 years old. He was 17 when he went to check on the welfare of his brothers. Now he's 30 years old, 30 years old when he enters the, the service of, of the king. And over the next seven years, um, the the. 20% uh, of the crops are put into storehouses. They started keeping track of it. Uh, but then verse 49 says, Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records 
because it was beyond measure, there's just no point in keeping records anymore because there are mountains of grain that are being stored away. He's also blessed with, with the birth of two sons, the oldest of whom is named Manasseh, the youngest of whom is named Ephraim. But as we'll see later in the story, it's going to follow this pattern in the, the book of Genesis of the, the dominance of the younger son over the older son. Uh, Ephraim will be the, the dominant tribe later in the history of Israel. And so this gets us to the point where the famine comes to the land. Verse 56, when the famine uh, had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. All the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. And we'll pick up in chapter 42 next week. Um, just so many lessons that we gain from this part of, of the text. Uh, Joseph began, you know, in the beginning of our discussion tonight, showing us, you know, how, how to maintain your, your integrity regardless of what it costs you. Uh, and we're called upon to do the same thing. Don't sacrifice your integrity. Uh, it might cost you your job. It might cost you a, a friendship. Uh, it might cause you to, to be falsely accused. That doesn't matter. You've got to maintain your faithfulness to God first and foremost. Uh, then we also learn that, as always, interpretations belong to God. God is a revelatory God. He's a God who wants to be known, and he reveals himself through uh, the, the fathers through the patriarchs and the prophets and in these last days has revealed uh, himself to us through his son. And just another powerful reminder as well that God is at work through the events uh, of this world um, to protect his people and to accomplish his, his will. What he does through Joseph is ultimately spare the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. And he works through all these events to do the, 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 this providential chain of events. He's not causing these things to happen, but he's working through them uh, for the protection of his people and the accomplishing of his will. God didn't make Joseph's brothers hate him and sell him as a slave. God didn't make Potiphar's wife lust after him and entice him and lie about him when she was rejected. God didn't make Pharaoh become angry uh, with his servants and throw them into jail. God didn't make the cupbearer forget about Joseph for two years. God didn't cause any of those things to happen, and yet he still accomplishes his will through them and in spite of them, as we'll see near the end of Joseph's story. There were people who were meaning these things for evil. God meant these things for good. God's not manipulating pieces on a chessboard. He's not making uh, these things happen. Human beings are making their choices. And in spite of those choices, God is still working his will. Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This verse doesn't say that everything that happens is good. This verse says that God is so great, God is so powerful, that despite even evil things that happen upon this earth, God can and will work through them, God will work around them, God will work in spite of them to accomplish his will. Again, thanks for being involved in the study tonight. We're going to wrap up there for this evening. I uh, hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the night. Look forward to uh, seeing you either in the auditorium or through the live stream on Sunday morning. Uh, again, God bless you all and have a wonderful evening.